21 years ago, IBM's Deep Blue chess computer defeated Garry Kasparov. It's the first time that an artificial chess player had beaten the world's best human. It was an incredible technical achievement. But it wasn't entirely satisfying. Deep Blue had essentially beaten Kasparov by brute force. It just outcomputed him. And it meant that although the game taught us a lot about computers, Kasparov felt we didn't really learn that much about human intelligence and decision making. Why could a computer get away with playing the game in this way? Well, one reason is the complexity. If we think of complexity in terms of the number of potential positions you could find yourself in during a game, in chess, there's about 100 billion, 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 billion such combinations. Obviously a lot, and it's certainly more than checkers, which was mastered by computers in the early 90s. But it's nowhere near as complex as something like Go, which was only really mastered by computers in the past couple of years. But it can't just be about complexity, because two-player poker with limited stakes actually has fewer possible game positions than checkers. And yet this is a game that computers have struggled with for much longer. So why is this? Well, as well as complexity, we need to think about information that's available. Checkers, chess, and Go are what's known as perfect information games. All the information you need to make a decision is right there in front of you. Poker, of course, is a game of hidden information. You don't know what your opponents have, they don't know what you have. And if you think about it, this makes the game much closer to the sort of situations we face in real life. Negotiations, auctions, bargaining, these all involve hidden information. And it means that, arguably, if a computer were to ever achieve true human-like intelligence, in effect, it would have mastered a highly complex hidden information game. And for this reason, researchers have had a long-standing interest in poker as a way of understanding human decisions. In fact, the whole modern theory of games originated with poker, originated in the 1920s with a mathematician called John von Neumann. Now, von Neumann was a brilliant researcher, but he wasn't so good at games like poker. And maybe at first glance, poker is the perfect game for a mathematician. It's a game of probabilities. It's the chance you get a decent hand, the chance your opponent gets a better one. But von Neumann realized there was more to it than that. Because you have this hidden information, there's an element of deception. You're trying to guess what your opponent has. They're trying to guess what you have. You're trying to guess what they're guessing. And he wanted to understand this back and forth process that was going on. And to do that, he looked at really, really simplified forms of the game. And one of these was a game where there's just two players that each get a single card, and there's one round of betting. And in this situation, von Neumann realized that there was a tug of war going on. Because in poker, everything you win comes out of your opponent's pocket. So both players are simultaneously trying to maximize what they win while minimize what they hand to their opponent. And studying this game, von Neumann showed that in this tug of war, there's an equilibrium point. There's a point where the forces balance and each player has an optimal strategy so that they wouldn't expect a better outcome if they did something different. And when he worked out this optimal strategy for this very simple game, he found that for the player who goes first, if they get dealt a high card, they should bet. Now, intuitively, that makes sense. If you've got a decent card, you put money on it. He found that if that first player gets dealt a kind of middling value card, they shouldn't bet. They should check and see what happens. Again, intuitively, that makes sense. But he found that the first player, if they get dealt a low value card, should bet. In other words, they should bluff. Now, of course, for centuries, players have been bluffing in games like this. But often it was thought of as something of a quirk of psychology. And here was von Neumann showing that that wasn't the case at all. Bluffing was a mathematical necessity in these games if you wanted the optimal strategy. Now, it was a powerful insight, but it's still a really simple form of poker. And it meant that, essentially, von Neumann could write down fixed rules for each player. So the first player, for example, if they get dealt a high or low card, they bet. If they get dealt a middling value card, they check. They follow those rules in the long run, they get the best expected outcome. But of course, real life isn't like that. Take, for example, a penalty kick. All things being equal, a right-footed player will have a better chance of scoring if they put the ball on the left side of the goal, their strong side. So perhaps players should always shoot on this side. Well, of course, if the keeper works out what they're doing, they're always going to go that way and reduce the chance of scoring. So perhaps instead, 
players should always shoot on their weak side. This should be the rule that they follow. But again, if the keeper guesses what they're doing, they're going to go that way and reduce their chance. And we've got this back and forth second guessing that von Neumann was interested in. In this situation, the optimal strategy is to play with an element of randomness. Don't always put it in the same side, mix it up a bit. And analyzing penalties, the mathematically optimal thing to do is to shoot on your strong side about 58% of the time and your weak side the remainder of the time. And what's amazing is that if you look at real life penalty data, this is almost the exact ratio that players shoot in. Now, I'm not claiming that they sit in the changing rooms working through the mathematics, but by trial and error, they've converged to the optimal strategy in this game. But again, here we're looking at a relatively simple situation. We've got two options. And in that poker game I mentioned, there were only two players and two cards. But of course, real life and real poker is far more complex than this. It's not something where we can just neatly write down the combinations and work out the mathematics. But fortunately, we can turn to another method. It's a technique that was developed by a colleague of John von Neumann. It was a mathematician called Stanislav Ulam. Now, Ulam was once playing solitaire. He was this card game, laying out cards, and wondered, what's the chance I'll lay out the cards in a way that allow me to finish the game? And he started writing down some different combinations and possibilities, and it just got far too complicated too quickly, and just realized he wasn't going to get an answer in this way. He thought, well, why not instead just lay out the cards, deal with the cards a few times, and see what happens? In other words, why not simulate the game to understand how it works? And he'd end up calling this method the Monte Carlo method. And this idea that you can simulate a random process to understand how it works. And the Monte Carlo method is now hugely important in science and technology. And it's really common in AI as well. And in fact, teams are now using this method to develop poker programs or poker bots that can play the game. When poker bots first became popular about 10 or 15 years ago, a common strategy was just to tell it what to do. If you're building a bot, you have your algorithm, and you say, in this situation, you do this. In this situation, you do that. But the problem with that approach is your bot will only ever be as good as you are. If you're telling it exactly what to do, your bot will be limited by your own abilities as a player. It won't be able to exceed your ability. But there's a better approach we can use. And it was one um, mentioned by Alan Turing, who was a pioneer of computing back in the 1950s. And he noted that if you're trying to build an intelligent machine, it doesn't make sense to build the adult mind with all its fixed rules and strategies. What you want to do is build the child mind and let it work out for itself how it should improve and learn in these games. And this is exactly what researchers are now doing. They're building poker bots that can play against each themselves, uh, themselves and each other and work out how the game should be played. And what's perhaps surprising is the way in which they learn to play the game. As they're playing at each point in the game, Rather than looking forward and saying, what strategy would give me the best possible outcome? Instead, they make decisions and look back and ask, what would have happened if I'd done something differently? This method is known as regret minimization. In effect, the bot at each point is working out how much it regrets its decision. And there's evidence that this is important for human learning as well. People who have damage to the part of the brain that's associated with the ability to experience regrets uh, can struggle in games that involve uncertainty and chance. In studies where they've been given games of logic, for example, putting cards in order, they're absolutely fine. But as soon as there's hidden information and risk, they really struggle to identify the optimal strategy. So it suggests this ability to experience regrets may be very important for how we learn to make decisions in an uncertain world. And these techniques have certainly been very powerful for these bots. In fact, these poker bots have been playing against each other billions and billions of times to the point that they've got so good that in 2015, researchers in Canada announced that poker is solved. Now, let's be specific here. What they'd shown is that for the two-player form of the game with limited stakes, their bot had found a strategy that in the long run would not lose even against a perfect opponent. In the long run, this bot was essentially unbeatable. It was an amazing achievement, not least because a lot of these researchers, by their own admission, aren't really poker players. But what they are good at is getting machines that can learn. And this bot has learned some of the strategies I've already mentioned. It bluffs. It plays with an element of randomness. And when you play this bot, 
it can feel quite uncomfortable. It feels somehow like you're being deceived and manipulated. And it's not just these world-class bots where this can happen. When I was writing about this topic, I, I built some very, very simple bots to try and understand more about them. And two things struck me. First, it didn't take much to build something that was better than I was. And that's a weird feeling, losing to something that you've built a few hours earlier. And the second thing I found is it didn't take much for the bot to frustrate me, and frustrate me in quite human ways. It sometimes felt like it was almost toying with me. And again, I knew that wasn't true. I'd built it, after all. But I still had that sensation. I've noticed that in interviews that people will often talk about these bots in very human terms. They'll slip into using human pronouns. And perhaps it's not that surprising, given that these machines are evolving many of the, te uh, the techniques and behaviors that we often associate with human decision making. But in some cases, these machines are challenging our ways of making decisions. This bot that solved poker would sometimes do something a bit odd. It would get dealt a pretty bad hand and bet on it, or it would get dealt the best possible hand and wouldn't bet the maximum. And it's not just this bot that would, would do it. The following year, a bot called uh, Claudico played some of the world's top humans at no limit poker, so a, a more complex form of the game. But again, it would do some weird things. It would sometimes bet loads of money to win a small amount, or it would seemingly hesitate and be indecisive. And in poker, there's a, a tactic known as limping, which is where at the start of the round, you bet the minimum possible amount. You limp into the game, as it were. And it's often seen as a nuisance tactic. It's something beginners do. Poker professionals look down on it. But Claudico limps surprisingly often, about 10% of the time. In fact, in Latin, Claudico means to limp. Now, why do these bots come out with these seemingly odd behaviors? Well, when we play games, we have to make mental simplifications to deal with the complexity involved. Uh, we say, this is a good situation, this is a bad situation. And we do exactly the same in daily life. We all make approximations to deal with the complexity of the world around us. But these bots are showing that those simplifications we use in games are too narrow, that sometimes these extreme, seemingly weird behaviors can actually be beneficial. And these bots, because they're not constrained by what is reportedly a good strategy, sometimes pick these behaviors and do well out of it. And these bots are also challenging the role of emotion in these games. When researchers first showed some of the early versions of these bots to poker professionals, the pros noted that these bots were quite passive. And in human games, aggression can be a very effective tactic. It puts people under pressure. It forces them to make mistakes. But Bots don't really react to emotion in the same way. And as these bots improve, it's likely that we're going to see changes in how humans play these games and the role of emotion in those kind of situations. And these bots are improving. Last year, four of the world's top players played a bot at two-player no-limits poker. So again, a more complex form of the game, and a form of the game that for a long time has been thought safe from computers. Many have seen it as a game of human psychology and creativity. It's more of an art than a science. Unfortunately, nobody told the bot. It turned up, and it won. And these bots are going to continue to improve. Historically, you'd need a supercomputer to build a superhuman poker bot. But last month, researchers showed that you could now get these bots to master poker on a desktop computer. Soon, these things will be running on smartphones. Perhaps all these developments sound alarming, but I believe there's an upside to this progress. Because games like poker are so similar to many of the situations we face in real life, we could potentially learn a lot about the sorts of decisions and risks we face every day. By losing to machines, we have the chance to gain a better understanding of ourselves. Thank you. <laughs>